This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. So welcome to this uh, episode of the uh, Anti-Capitalist Chronicles. And I'm going to offer some reflections on uh, the difficulty of uh, being an anti-capitalist in these times. Uh, And right now, I'm very much concerned with asking the question, are there some bright spots? Uh, uh, Leonard Cohen's famous song about there's a crack, there's a crack in everything, but that's how the light gets in. Um, So is there some light getting in and to shed that betokens something about the future that might be better than where we are right now, given that where we are right now is pretty miserable. It seems there's nowhere else to go but uh, up or out or whatever. But there have been some uh, a couple of things which uh, have given me quite a bit of encouragement over the last uh, uh, few weeks. And uh, the first is uh, the election in Chile, uh, in which uh, a young guy, 35 years old, named Boric, became president. He'd been a leader of the insurrectionary movement of 2019. Um, he comes from a sort of a pretty radical background. And uh, he uh, swept his way against uh, some very, very powerful, well-financed opposition on the part of some very, very right-wing uh, organizations. And uh, so that uh, suggests that there's something really, really positive there. A bit further north in Peru, so a leftist became elect- elected, but uh, it was a leftist who really didn't know uh, <laughs> which way was up, I think, and so it's a bit of a, a mess in, in Peru. Uh, Colombia, there's uh, an election coming along which could be uh, some shake-up. Uh, we could get somebody with a more left perspective uh, coming into power there. And, of course, in Brazil, the election in, in the fall, and uh, all the signs are that Lula will make a combat, comeback and Bolsonaro will be uh, out. Uh, and, again, uh, while I'm not uh, enormously enthusiastic about Lula, I'm very glad he, he, he can uh, at least get rid of Bolsonaro. And, uh, and, and in Europe, uh, there is something uh, really fantastic going on, or at least I think I might call it fantastic, because uh, uh, Luc uh, Mélenchon, who was the leader of uh, uh, this organization called Insomise, which means the insubordinate ones, um, came in very, very, you know, just one percentage point behind Marine Le Pen in the, in the uh, presidential uh, election. And since then, he has organized an alliance. And we suddenly see in France an electoral alliance because you have a strange system there in which uh, you elect the president and then uh, a few weeks later you elect parliament. And uh, so the parliamentary election is coming up and uh, Mélenchon has got together with uh, other organizations on the left to form an, an electoral alliance. And it's an electoral alliance, which includes the socialists, it includes the communists, and it includes the Greens. And they are going to run for the election. And there is the, the remote possibility uh, that uh, this alliance could actually command a majority in Parliament, in which case uh, Macron, who won the presidency, will be in this peculiar situation of having to appoint a prime minister uh, from uh, this uh, dissident uh, alliance. And uh, one of the things that's being said right now is that Mélenchon is going and saying, well, really this uh, election for parliament coming up is an election for the prime minister and I would like to be prime minister. And so everybody is saying, uh, let's elect uh, Mélenchon prime minister. And so he will be prime minister negotiating with Macron as president. It's a very peculiar uh, situation. But uh, it seems that the left is making some sort of uh, come comeback, and we, therefore we can have some sort of uh, encouragement. Uh, and, and encouragement also because it seems that a lot of the people on the right, even, even though Orban got re-elected very strongly in Hungary, a lot of the sort of authoritarian figures on the right are not doing too well. 
Uh, Erdogan uh, is in a real mess in Turkey with his crazy ideas about keeping interest rates low in the midst of uh, in incredible inflation. So, so, and uh, Boris Johnson is not doing very well either. So, you know, so maybe, maybe the balance is, is tending to shift a little bit. But when I say that, it immediately then kind of says to me that I have to be careful about what I say about this and not sound too enthusiastic about all, all of these things which are going on. Because if you start sounding enthusiastic, people start looking at you and say, what do you mean? Uh, that you think this is a good thing. I mean, aren't you an anti-capitalist? Well, what's anti-capitalist about, uh, you know, being glad, glad about Mélenchon and uh, all of his programs uh, to re retire at 60 and raise the minimum wage and do all those kinds of things? You know, what's, what's anti-capitalist about uh, all of that? And I've had some, how do we put it, I said, well, I put it, uh, somewhat peculiar experiences around that. And I thought I would... I recount just uh, one of them, which was that uh, back in February of 2003, uh, I was uh, scheduled to give a series of lectures in Oxford University, and I chose the theme of the new imperialism. And in February 2003, I went to Oxford to give these lectures. Uh, February 2003, at that time, there was a, the drum beats of uh, war were in the air. The Bush administration was making noises about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Uh, February 15th, uh, there was this huge worldwide demonstration, uh, sort of saying, don't go to war in Iraq. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the the Bush administration was absolutely uh, determined to do so and uh, did so on March 20th with the invasion of Iraq. And this, of course, immediately then poses what I think uh, is a very important uh, question. And that question is, to what degree do elections have consequences? If, for example, Al Gore who got elected in 2000 and not Bush, I'm pretty sure we would never have invaded Iraq. And if we had never invaded Iraq, world history, I think, to this day would have been very, very different from where it is now. And therefore, that election and that close election with all the hanging chads and all this kind of thing, and Gore giving up at a certain point, my own view was he should have stuck it out and continued to fight uh, in, in a way that, uh, of course, Trump has been doing, even though he has no basis for it. In Gore's case, he had a basis for it, and he could actually, I think, have probably won the election if the Supreme Court had not handed it effectively to Bush. So, so here's this here's this situation. But at, at that time, I was giving these lectures on the new imperialism, and I, I, I was very, very angry when the war broke out on, in March. Uh, and I wrote I wrote the new imperialism book uh, very very fast, and uh, it came out uh, shortly afterwards. And uh, in it, I made some sort of comments about the political situation uh, in 2003. And one of the things I noticed in the, about the uh, situation was the United States economy was not doing well. At that point, I made some comments about the way in which the property market was running out of control. We were beginning to see. Uh, all kinds of cracks in the in, in, in the U.S. economy. So, in addition to the war, there was that problem. There was, was the China problem. But interestingly, I also said in, in the new imperialism that China was likely to be strong developer and, to some degree, would would, would help rescue global capitalism, which it, which it ultimately did. But towards the end of the book, I was looking at the situation and I and I said the the following following that. Really, given the political landscape in 2003, and this is the point, the political landscape in the United States, throughout Europe, and around the world, and given the kind of problems and, 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 and so on that existed economically, and of course the incipient war uh, and the actual war which, which broke out, you kind of said, well, what, what, kind, of, what kind of politics was possible uh, at that moment? And I said this, the only possible albeit temporary answer to this problem, within the rules of any capitalist mode of production, that is, without being specifically anti-capitalist, is some sort of new deal that has a global reach. 
This means liberating the logic of capital circulation and accumulation from its neoliberal chains, reformulating state power along much more interventionist and redistributive lines, curbing the speculative powers of finance capital, which are doing so much damage in the property market, and decentralizing or de democratically controlling the overwhelming power of oligopolies and monopolies, in particular the nefarious influence of the military-industrial complex to dictate everything from terms of international trade to what we see, read, and hear in the media. The effect will be a return to a more benevolent New Deal imperialism, preferably arrived at through the sort of coalition of capitalist powers that Kautsky long ago envisaged. Now, notice that I said this, the only, this seemed to me the only possible politics of the time, and therefore I would, I would support this kind of politics. Well, uh, when the reviews came out of this book, everybody was going on about how I'd lost my anti-capitalist marbles. I didn't know what was Marxist and what was and was not Marxist. I was, you know, just becoming a bourgeois kind of apologist for social democracy and all this kind of thing. I got some really savage criticism. Uh, for, for, for writing this, even though I said it's contingent on the situation, it's the best thing I can see for the, for the very situation. So I, I got a bit burned by that, and I sort of thinking, but then I thought to myself, well, why should I be burned by that? Because it's interesting, you see, uh, when, when you go back and you say, well, what kind of Marxist was Marx? Uh, one of his most famous comments, which I'm always going back to, is this idea that there is uh, the, 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 the genuine freedom begins when the realm of necessity is left behind. And this is what he said in Volume 3 of Capital. And, and he talks about, about, about uh, the realm of freedom and how significant that is and how, it, how it's a kind of socialist, communist vision of a realm of freedom. But the realm of freedom begins after basic necessities are taken care of. But at the end of this paragraph, he then says, the first step on this is the reduction of the working day to, to 10 hours. Now, that's a pretty reformist demand, just saying, okay, the first, but notice something. He said the first step is the reduction of the length of the working day. And that this was a, a fairly mild kind of thing from by today's standards in terms of something. So in some ways, I suddenly realized why it was that Marx, at some point or other, when faced with the sorts of criticisms he was sometimes faced with, said, well, Marx, he said, well, look, I'm not a Marxist. And so there are Marxist factions around who are really going to go after you if you kind of say, yeah, I, I actually think it's a good idea if Lula wins. Yeah, it's a good idea if Jeremy Corbyn had won. I, yes, it's a good idea that uh, uh, Boric, Boric won in, in, in Chile. It's a good idea that they're putting together this alliance, this kind of uh, almost popular front of left parties, because they're not talking about any, rev any revolution. They're not really being very anti-capitalist, but they are taking first steps towards an anti-capitalist future. And I would like to suggest that we take first steps towards an anti-capitalist future. And what I was suggesting in the New Imperialism book when I wrote this was to say, look, I think there will, there, there will be a lot of people around, given the, the big march on, on, on February the 15th, I think there will be a lot of people around who would say yes to a New Deal anti-imperialism kind of coalition, which would also be anti-war and that therefore the possibility existed that we could begin to take the first steps towards some, something new, something different, some alternative to where we're at. But, but no, the, the, the people on the left, you know, people in the multi-review, the Socialist Workers' Party, all of those people went on and on and on about how, you know, what a wimp I, I'd become and uh, nobody should listen to me. My, 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 my left uh, credentials were shredded by, by the fact that I had said that. Uh, at that time, that was the only possible the configuration uh, as far as I could see now. There might be a debate of saying, well, no, actually, there's a different configuration, but I don't think there was. And here we are, 20 years later, more or less, when we have these, these things, which are actually really not much different from what was being looked for there. 
and 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 maybe I'm getting some stimulus and getting some light and hoping you know that this is betokening some sort of light getting in and we're beginning to get shafts of new possibilities and some 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 excitement can be generated around these 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 developments. And and we can actually look forward to something you know radically different way in the future. That is, the anti-capitalism comes down the line, but that right now it's the equivalent of Marx kind of saying, "Well, the first step is the limitation of the working day to ten hours." That is going to be those small incremental steps which are going to take us to a, a position where we can actually start to think uh, differently. Now, in this regard, I think there's also the possibility of thinking about the traditions that uh, the people that people work with and, and and some of the strong traditions that could be called upon in the past to try to animate the, uh, the present and animate the, the pathway to a different kind of future. The French have this revolutionary tradition and, 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 and there's no doubt about it. All of those factions, by the way, uh, that came have come together in the alliance, during the presidential election, they were shredding Mélenchon attacking him violently as being compromising or leftist, you know, opportunist and all that kind of thing. So they buried all of that and said, okay, we're, we're, we're going we're, we're to bury that and, 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 and start with something which is going to be, you know, a, a genuine alliance. And actually the point there is they see this as a way of preserving themselves because the way the alliance will work is in those constituencies where the communist a candidate came out uh, uh, the strongest in the alliance, then the Communist Party will 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 run for parliament with the support of all of the other groups. Now, in the place where Mélenchon's group came in, they would be supported by all the other groups. So, so actually, all of the, the factions, the socialists and the communists and, and the Greens, will will get a share of the vote and, 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 and therefore benefit from this alliance. And for that reason, they're no longer saying all the nasty things about uh, L'Insoumise and uh, Mélenchon that they were once upon a time saying. But then the question of, of, of uh, the, 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 the heritage and, and, and what the left heritage is, is about. And this brings me a little bit to this country because the question arises, well, okay, we have our uh, sort of uh, left Democrats, they're social Democrats, Bernie Sanders and, and Democratic Socialists and uh, AOC and, and so on. So there's a... There's a there's a there's a strongish group there which which is which has some kind of uh, idea about a, a political program which is not going to be anti-capitalist in the rigorous sense of it's going to get rid of capitalism tomorrow, but it's a sort of program which actually is 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 enriching in the sense that it can actually take us step by step uh, towards some kind of uh, alternative, and so I would want to see us. Uh, start to think in this country, you know, more clearly about uh, about this, and this is happening a little bit with DSA and the socialist conferences and 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 so on. And in this regard, I kind of uh, was also reminded of of a time when I went, I, I wrote a, a sort of op-ed piece uh, uh, along these lines. This is some time back now, and I can't even remember what year it was, but. But in which in which I, I talked about uh, the Roosevelt Roosevelt tradition, and I talked about uh, Roosevelt, and I and I suggested that Roosevelt had set up something, and I and I'd read somewhere I don't know quite where that actually Roosevelt uh, had a, a program of what he called eight freedoms, and these eight freedoms were going to be the center of uh, of uh, his 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 political thinking. Now, when I wrote this and I sent this off as an op-ed piece somewhere, the immediate response I got was, I'm talking, you know, nonsense, because it was everybody knew that, that Roosevelt uh, had, in fact, established the idea of four freedoms. And just to consolidate the fact, you know, I live in Manhattan and there's Roosevelt Island in the middle of the East River and the bottom of Roosevelt Island, there's the Four Freedoms Park. So... The, uh, this association of, uh, of uh, Roosevelt and the Four Freedoms is very strong. It's very strong in the media, and the Four Freedoms were freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from want, and, and, and freedom from fear. 
And those were the four freedoms. And, and the right wing were kind of going on and on about, uh, about, about his four freedoms and that it wasn't libertarian enough and all the rest of it. So Roosevelt actually, over, over, uh, during the Second World War, was elaborating more and more about what, what kinds of freedoms were very, very necessary. And in 1944, he gave a State of the Union address in which he outlined what, these, what, what were eight freedoms. In other words, I had been right that there were eight freedoms, and I thought it would be very interesting to then say, well, to what degree is this the kind of uh, programmatic statement which we might want to, to use for today? Let's resurrect uh, Roosevelt's, uh, what Roosevelt said in the 1944 State of the Union address, and let me read it to you. He says this, This republic had its beginning and grew to its present strength under the protection of certain inalienable political rights, among them the right of free speech, free press, free worship, trial by jury, freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures. That's more freedoms than than four, but it's not eight. As our nation has grown in size and stature, however, as our industrial economy expanded, these political rights proved inadequate to assure us equality in the pursuit of happiness. We have come to a clear realization of the fact that true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence. Necessitous men are not free men. This is a very interesting phrase because it goes back in a way to Marx's kind of comment that the realm of freedom begins when the realm of necessity is left behind. And this is a very important argument that Marx made. I'm sure Roosevelt didn't take it from Marx, but on the other hand, it it is compatible entirely with what Marx said. And that phrase, that necessitous men are not free men, and that the realm of freedom begins where the realm of uh, necessity is left behind, was absolutely crucial in 1978 when Deng Xiaoping and a lot of sort of young scholars were sitting around saying, what are the grounds on which we can actually revive our economy? Because the economy in China was in very bad shape at that time, and they knew they had to do something. And it turns out that this phrase, that the realm of necessity uh, has to be overcome for the realm of freedom to begin, this phrase was critical to that, that transformation which occurred in which Deng Xiaoping basically said, we have to organize society so that we actually take care of the necessities. We have not done that. We have not successfully done that. And until we have successfully done that, the realm of freedom cannot begin. Therefore, the drive to the realm of freedom and the drive to socialism and the realm of freedom depends upon us first increasing productivity in society so that all of the necessities are taken care of. And that was, of course, the big project that Deng Xiaoping got in and and has still been a central part of the the Chinese project right up until the present day, though, as we will see, uh, there are problems with the Chinese model right now. So necessitous men, then, says Roosevelt, are not free men. People who are hungry and out of a job Uh, the stuff of which dictatorships are made. In our days, these economic truths have become accepted as self-evident. We have accepted, so to speak, a second Bill of Rights, under which a new basis of security and prosperity can be established for all, regardless of station, race or creed. Among these, notice it is not complete, it's among these are the right to a useful, and remunerative job in the industries or shops or farms or mines of the nation. Second, the right to earn enough to provide adequate food and clothing and recreation. Third, the right of every farmer to raise and sell his products at a return which will give him and his family a decent living. Four, the right of every businessman, large and small, to trade in an atmosphere of freedom from unfair competition and domination by monopolies at home or abroad. Obviously, this is not anti-capitalist, but it is social democratic. Then comes a series of freedoms which I think are very significant. The right of every family to a decent home. 
this crisis of affordable housing has to be dealt with. The right to adequate medical care and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health. Well, that's an obvious one. The right to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age, sickness, accident, and unemployment, that is, adequate social security arrangements. The right to a good education. And then Roosevelt concludes as follows. All these rights spell security. And after this war is won, we must be prepared to move forward in the implementation of these rights to new goals of human happiness and well-being. America's own rightful place in the world depends in large part upon how fully these and similar rights have been carried into practice for our citizens. For unless there is security here at home, there cannot be lasting peace in the world. One of the great American industrialists of our day, a man who has rendered yeoman service to his country in this crisis, recently emphasized the grave dangers of rightist reaction in this nation. All clear-thinking businessmen share his concern. Indeed, if such reaction should develop, if history were to repeat itself, and we were to return to the so-called normalcy of the 1920s, then it is certain that even though we shall have conquered our enemies on the battlefield abroad, we shall have yielded to the spirit of fascism here at home. Now, it's very interesting. I find this a fantastic statement. And I really wonder what would happen if we tried to get it republished in the New York Times today. People would be very uh, outraged. But here you see, this is a reformist. And I'm, I'm going to be you know, blasted to hell probably by, by, by all of the, quote, true believer Marxists and anti-capitalists if I say, listen, this is a really good starting point. Let's start with this. Let's start with this and start with what the kind of thing that Mélenchon is saying, adding in things like the question of environment and ecology and the Green New Deal and all those things. That is, we have a tradition in this country of this kind of thinking. But even the mainstream has occluded the radicalism that was there within the edge of the Roosevelt Project. Even the mainstream says, oh, there are only four freedoms. Yes, we can celebrate the four freedoms. No, let's take these eight freedoms and let's run with them. This seems to me to be something which we really could do. And I would like to see us go for it. And that is what, you know, in some ways, Bernie Sanders in AOC and DSA and so on are sort of beginning to do. But there is this, this long, long tradition. And again, I would want to kind of suggest that, yes, I'm an anti-capitalist. But also I know, as Marx kind of said, there are long battles to be fought until we can get to an anti-capitalist stage, an anti-capitalist situation. And in the same way that Marx kind of said, look, the limitation of all of this, of, uh, of the... Uh, you know, the limitation of the length of the working day is a really be good beginning point as far as he was concerned towards the first step moving onwards. And I noticed something here. These last freedoms which uh, Roosevelt, the right uh, to, a, to a decent home, the right to adequate medical care, and the right to good education. Just think about those three. And it's interesting. Just before the pandemic struck, uh, Xi Jinping laid out a, a theme of where China was going to go in the next few years. And that theme was they were going to, going to uh, explore common prosperity. And in laying out what was common prosperity, Xi Jinping said, there are three mountains we have to climb. And they're difficult mountains to climb. The first is the mountain of affordable housing. Now, this is strange because China has surplus apartments up the wazoo, but affordable housing is different from having apartments. We have a lot of apartments available here in New York, but affordable ones, 
Forget it. So affordable housing, good, affordable, and a proper access of health care for all. And that, by the way, is a very important demand because once that demand is there, that means that everybody, no matter your sexuality, your, 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 your race, your, your gender, and all that, everybody should have equal access to the health care possibilities. Everybody should have equal access to affordable housing. Everybody should have equal access to educational possibilities. So those three mountains, which Xi Jinping said had to be climbed in order to arrive at a sphere of common prosperity, they're the three mountains we have to climb. And isn't it interesting? If we kind of just said, look, this is what we've got to do and this is how we're going to do it. These are the, the things that, that, that really need to. And I think that, that, that you know, just circulating Roosevelt's statement and putting it all over the place and saying, look, this, is, this was what it, how it was envisaged back in 1944. In the atmosphere of this war is coming to an end, we have a new pos possible world to construct. This is what we're going to try to do. And the failure and, and the inability to do it has been one of the big tragedies of American life. We would not be where we are today had we listened and had we understood that there are eight freedoms, not four, and that Roosevelt had these eight freedoms lying there and we could add to them because, he, as he says, among these freedoms, these are, the, these are the eight that he is choosing to focus on. And there are some real mountains to climb in here. Economic security, job opportunities, meaningful jobs, uh, and a decent, decent living environment and a decent wage. Everybody has the right to a decent living environment and, 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 and a, a decent house in a decent living environment. These are the kinds of issues which it seems to me we could well start to mobilize around and organize around. And this is therefore, for me, uh, uh, yes, okay, it's not anti-capitalist in the, in the rig rigorous sense of anti-capitalist, but it's where an anti-capitalist like me is going to start. And I think those people who come out and say, I've lost my marbles because I'm no longer talking about revolution down the line. Well, you know, forget it right now. The time is not ripe. Yes, situations could arise. Right now, we have a, a, a heinous war and all kinds of things have to be said about that. Again, we are in a situation where an anti-war movement plus uh, the, the sort of program that uh, is being set out by here by Roosevelt, and which is the kind of program that Xi Jinping was envisaging before they got into all the difficulties they've got into with the, the virus and with the, uh, the, 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 the economy and so on. So there it seems to me we ought to be willing to compromise, willing to work, willing to work that in there is a, that there's a long-run objective, but in the short run, we have to look for the cracks. We have to look where the sh light is shining in, and we have to try to open the cracks and, and, and let more, sh more light shine in. And right now, you're beginning to see some cracks in the facade of this uh, sort of dour, anti, uh, uh, this dour authoritarian, neo-fascist kind of, kind of thinking. So this is something which I think we can go for, and, 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 and it's therefore... Uh, possible also to root it in tradition. It's always good to be able to do that, but to say this is meaningful for us today. We missed the opportunity in 1944. We are now going to recreate the opportunity in 2022. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.